So we've been talking about thermodynamics and we've kind of leveled up to the point where we can start to look at cycles instead of fixing individual states or moving between one state and another state to perform a process. But before we kind of dive in more in depth into how to do Rankine cycles, first we're going to zoom back out a little bit and just remind ourselves why we're doing this, right? So thermodynamics is the study of turning heat into work, right? So in thermodynamics, we take heat energy and turn it into mechanical energy, right? It's this class is all about energy transfer and doing these energy transactions in the universe. And lately, we've been talking about Rankine cycles. Now, Rankine cycles are important here in the United States maybe not as important as they were a decade or two ago where they potentially were producing 80% of the total power in the United States. But at least according to this source, we still get about 45% of our electrical power from coal power plants and nuclear power plants. So this is still a very important way how we're getting energy in the United States. And we've talked about what a Rankine cycle is, at least in its most basic form. And I've said that a couple of times, but in order to have a Rankine cycle, you need to be performing at least four processes, right? And we can draw this out on a TS diagram. And here, remember the workhorse, the purpose of doing one of these Rankine cycles is to generate power in the turbine. The rest of the processes inside the cycle, that's the condenser, the pump and the boiler are only there so we can get back to the inlet of the turbine. And you can see that as we draw this on our TS diagram, we go through our real turbine where our entropy is increasing. Then we condense back down to a liquid. We use a pump to increase the pressure. It takes less power to do that when we have a liquid instead of a vapor. And then we add heat to boil that water and get back to the turbine inlet. Now we often classify power plants based on how we get that heat. So we can be burning coal or we can be performing a nuclear reaction, which is exothermic, right? It's creating heat and we use that heat to boil water. So when we talk about this kind of thermodynamics, this is literally what thermodynamics is, right? What the word means is we're going to take heat and turn it into power. So this, a Rankine cycle, is a heat engine, right? There's different kinds of heat engines that we'll talk about in this class, but the first one we'll talk about is this Rankine cycle. Now we want to characterize this heat engine, and we do that by looking at the energy benefit divided by the energy cost. And in this case, the energy benefit is net power. We're trying to get the shaft of that turbine to spin. Then we look at the energy cost and the energy cost is that we have to add heat. And that happens either by burning coal in a Rankine cycle or by performing a nuclear reaction, which is also generating heat. So both of those things are energy costs to the system. I've said this a couple of times, but it's important to remember that it's not net heat on the bottom because in any sort of closed heat engine, the net work is going to equal the net heat. So if we put net heat on the bottom, then our efficiency would always be 100%, and it wouldn't be very beneficial to calculate the thermal efficiency. If we're talking about a Carnot efficiency, we know that we can turn this net heat into Q in minus Q out, or Q dot in minus Q dot out, and then anytime we have a ratio of heat transfer rates, if we want to get the ideal version of that equation, we substitute those Q dots for T's. So if we want our Carnot efficiency, this is going to be T hot minus T cold over T hot or 1 minus T cold over T hot. But how do we get there for a real system? For a real system, we can't just rely on the Carnot efficiency because oftentimes we can't even approach that Carnot efficiency. We certainly saw that when we were looking at our simple four component Rankine cycle. 
So to get the real performance, what we'll do is we'll do a first law analysis on each of the individual components, and that'll help us find the net power generated and the heat transfer rate in. But to do that, we have to look at the turbine, the pump, and the boiler, and we have to make some assumptions. So assumptions we'll often make for these components include that the system or the process is occurring at steady state, that it's one inlet and one outlet, that there's no change in kinetic energy, no change in potential energy, and then often for these three components, we'll choose that they're either adiabatic or passive. So we'll often model these components as simple systems where only Q dot or W dot survive. So when we're thinking about turbines and pumps, we probably want to keep the power term since it's the power that's important for those processes. But for the boiler, we're interested in the heat transfer rate, so we'll assume that that's passive and we'll cancel out W dot. Inside the cycle, we'll assume that there are no friction losses and no heat losses, and that will sort of make our lives a little bit easier because it means we fix less states. Because basically the state that's coming out of the turbine will be the same state that's going into the condenser and all the way through all of our components. But when we do this, we'll get these symbolic equations, provided that we can make all those simplifying assumptions that I talked about before. Right, so for our turbine, we'll see that the power generated by the turbine is m dot times h in minus h out. The condenser is m dot times h out minus h in. The pump is m dot times h in minus h out. And the boiler is m dot times h out minus h in. Now this is only true. This is not exactly what the textbook tells us. But again, I'm going to tell you, always get these equations from the first law and let hip to win determine what your signs mean. So our turbine power, because the turbine is generating power, we're going to assume this is positive. Our condenser, we're rejecting heat, so this should be negative. Our pump is producing or is requiring power to operate, so it's work in, and that should be negative. And our boiler is adding heat to our system, and so we should be have a positive Q dot term there. So at this point, we have our symbolic equations and we're at the point in this thermodynamic problem where we would ask ourselves, what's the fluid? That's what we need to know in order to find these delta H terms. And for a Rankine cycle, the fluid is going to be water or at least it's going to be some type of material that's bouncing back and forth across the vapor dome. So we did this problem before with our four component Rankine cycle. Right? And we found that when we had turbine and pump efficiencies of 85%, that our thermal efficiency was 28.4%. Right? And we've said before, well, we're not exactly sure if that's a good number or a bad number because you can't really compare the thermal efficiency to 100%. Instead, we want to compare the actual thermal efficiency to the Carnot efficiency. And if we did that, if we knew, in this case, we knew the temperatures of the hot reservoir and the cold reservoir, and we found that our Carnot efficiency was 55.3%. So we're at about half of the Carnot efficiency. So hopefully there's room for some improvement here because maybe we could double the amount of work that we get, or at least if we could approach the Carnot efficiency, we could almost double the amount of power we're getting for every unit of heat that we're putting into the system. So the good news is that mechanical engineers have been working on this problem for a long time and there are some strategies that we can use to increase the thermal efficiency. And we'll cover some of those strategies over the next few lectures. So the purpose of this lecture is to look at how we improve rank and efficiency. We're going to talk about superheat, reheat, and regeneration. So why do we want to improve thermal efficiency, right? Maybe this is the first question, because does it really matter, right? Is this a really important thing to do? And I think that this is definitely really important for all of us that live here on Earth. Right now, as engineers, it's important for us to be able to think and talk 
in the way that maybe our supervisors are going to understand. And a lot of times, right, when you're making a business decision, right, the purpose of a company is to increase the value for the shareholders. So numbers with dollar signs in front of them are always going to be important. And the great thing about improving efficiency is that it will save us money. Right. So if we're trying to produce the same amount of power and we can increase efficiency, it means we burn less coal. Right. And that means that our input costs are less. Right. Now, if you're talking about this from like an engineering economics point of view, you're going to have to see what your upfront costs are to improve your physical plant. And then you have to see versus your operating costs. And you can kind of use the time value of money to see if it's a good financial decision or not. But there is an economic argument that you can make here. Right now, another important argument here is that, you know, I live here on Earth. Right. And you live here on Earth, I I think. Right. I don't know how far this transmission is going, but I'm pretty sure that if you're watching this video, you live on Earth just like me, which means we're probably all interested in reducing emissions from power plants. Right. So if we get more thermal efficiency, again, if this is a coal fired power plant, it means we're burning less coal, which means we're getting the same amount of power with less emissions. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing with a nuclear power plant, too, because even though nuclear is emission free, if we can get the same amount of power by using less fuel, then we have less nuclear waste that we have to worry about. Right. So it's important to improve thermal efficiency from a financial point of view, but also from an environmental point of view. So there's a really, you know, the incentives are lining up here. So it's important to improve thermal efficiency. So we've said before that maybe having these idealized equations aren't that useful. Right. Because no system is actually going to give you the Carnot efficiency. Right. But the cool thing here is we get a very simple equation. Right. And this simple equation can tell us something, right? It can actually tell us two things, right? I would like my Carnot efficiency or my efficiency of my plant to approach one or 100%. The way I do that is by making this fraction very small, right? So how can I make this fraction very small, right? If I increase T hot, the denominator in that fraction, then the fraction goes down, right? If I decrease cold, so if I'm rejecting heat to a lower and lower temperature, then my fraction also goes down. So doing both of those things should help me improve efficiency, at least in the ideal case. And usually there's some spillover to the real case. If I can do both of these things in a real system, I still might not get the Carnot efficiency, but I'll probably still improve the efficiency of my plant, right, of my cycle. So even from this very simple idealized equation, we as engineers can look at this with imperfect information and already we have two strategies that we can use to improve performance. So how do we increase the temperature, T hot, right? So if I had a fuel that burned hot enough and if I had materials that could hold that hot material, right? So that that didn't melt under those hot temperatures. Then when I took this high pressure fluid, I can keep adding heat past this saturated vapor point, right? So I can keep adding heat until I'm in some portion of my superheated vapor region, right? So I can superheat the fluid that's going into my turbine. And when I do that, my cycle diagram changes, Right. So here, this is again. So this is idealized because I have an isentropic turbine in this picture. Right. And I have an isentropic pump. But if I increase my heat, if I increase my maximum temperature, then I can get a higher enthalpy state going into my turbine. And if I can do that, I'm going to get more power out. So if I do this, I have some extra cost. Right. Because I'm increasing heat transfer in. But I'm also increasing the average temperature of heat addition, which tends to increase thermal efficiency. I'm also increasing the amount of power that I generate from my turbine. See how this line is longer, right, than this line over here? So that means I'm producing more power. Hopefully that means I have more net work because I'm not changing what's going on on the pump side. So my net work should be increasing. I'm increasing my T hot 
the hot temperature of my reservoir, because otherwise maybe I wouldn't be able to get to this point, right? I'm at least average, increasing the average temperature of heat addition. And I have the same T cold, right? So all of this combines to increase my thermal efficiency. So in general, if I can increase the temperature that my superheated vapor is going into my turbine, or even if I can move from a saturated vapor to a superheated vapor, I tend to increase my thermal efficiency. That's like increasing T hot in my Carnot equation. Then we could even do something that's super critical, right? So what happens in a super critical system, right? So now we know our critical pressure is the pressure that just kisses the top of this vapor dome that doesn't actually cut through the vapor dome, but just kisses right on the apex here. So if we're super critical, then that means we increase this liquid to a pressure that's higher than the critical pressure. Now, if we do that, what happens is to do this, first, we need to be adding heat at a very high temperature, right? Because every time we pressurize this liquid, we have to add more and more heat in order to boil it, right? Because that pressure is trying to force those water molecules together, whereas heating it up is trying to split those molecules apart into a vapor. So we have to put more heat in to do this. But if we can get to this supercritical state, then we get similar things that happen, right? Although we are increasing the cost here, we're increasing the amount of work we have to do because we have to increase the power to get to this higher pressure. Although we've seen that in these Rankine cycles, um, it doesn't take too much power relative to the turbine power to increase the pressure of the liquid. So hopefully that's not too much of a problem. We're increasing the amount of heat that we have to put in because now we're boiling this water at a higher temperature, which means we have to put more heat in to separate those molecules into a vapor. But we get a lot more power out of our turbine, right? This line becomes much longer here. And that is increasing our net power because the amount of power generated by the turbine increases faster than the amount of power that we're putting into the pump. So our net power increases. Again, we're increasing the T hot here, the temperature where we're adding heat. We're increasing this average temperature of heat addition, and that works to increase our thermal efficiency. We have the same T cold in this case because nothing is changing at the condenser. All of these things, they combine to increase our efficiency. So we can increase the efficiency by superheating our fluid, but we can also have supercritical fluids going into the turbine, and that increases thermal efficiency as well, by the same manner in that we're increasing our T hot. So both superheating and supercritical um, are increasing our efficiency basically by increasing the hot temperature of the reservoir. Now, this is great. Why don't we just increase that temperature up to infinity, right? Now, there's two things that sort of limit that. So the first is the material properties of the turbine and the boiler. So we need for our fluids to be moving through these structures that aren't melting, right? So we need to have friends who are materials engineers that are making maybe a new type of steel so that uh, the turbine doesn't melt. We also need to be friends with chemical engineers who are making new fuels because, you know, just like if you put... Um, if you put something in the oven, it can only get as hot as that oven temperature, right? This is the idea. I don't know if anybody's seen uh, the idea of maybe cooking a steak or something sous vide. So that means under vacuum. So you put the steak in a bag. This is, uh, this is an aside. I like cooking and my wife is French Canadian. So, you know, you know, and I grew up in Canada, so I know what some of these French words mean. But if you ever want something to sound fancy, you say it in French. Because if you say, oh, I'm just going to go cook my steak under vacuum, that doesn't sound nearly as cool as I'm going to go cook my steak sous vide, right? So what you do when you cook something sous vide is you set the water temperature equal to the final temperature you want for your steak. You put your steak in this vacuum sealed bag and you just leave it there, right? And eventually you're going to get up to that temperature and that's the temperature it's going to be, right? It can't get hotter than that because you can't add any more heat because heat only goes from high temperatures to low temperatures. So you can't heat up the fluid hotter than the temperature you're getting from burning your fuel, like say carbon in the case of coal, or by performing this nuclear reaction, the, the fluid can only get as hot as 
what happens in that reaction, right? So sometimes you're limited by the hot temperature of your fuel source. We also know from this Carnot equation that we could improve efficiency if we reduced T cold. So what does that look like, right? So what it looks like is we have a low pressure where our condensation happens. So we try to reduce this pressure coming out from the turbine so it doesn't just go down to atmospheric pressure, but maybe it goes below atmospheric pressure. Right? And when that happens, that means that this phase change process is going to happen at a colder temperature. Right? So in this case, this condensation, that's our floor, that's our T cold. So now we're increasing the amount of power that we produce in the turbine, and we're cooling this down at a colder temperature. We do have to add more power in at our pump, but like we've said, the pump powers here tend to be small relative to the turbine power. So this increases the cost because the pump power is going to get big, but our backwork ratios are usually pretty low in these Rankin cycles. We have the same amount of heat transfer in in this case. We didn't change the boiling process. We can increase our turbine power because now this line is longer. We're going to a lower pressure. We're increasing our net power because the turbine power, again, is increasing faster than the pump power is. And we're decreasing our T cold. So all of these things combine to reduce the, or to increase the thermal efficiency, right? So T cold is often limited by the environment, right? Or sometimes by environmental regulation, right? So oftentimes this um, heat, we're, the heat we're rejecting is often going into the environment. So we rightfully have uh, some regulations regarding how we do that. So sometimes this is limited by our environmental temperatures. So there's some other things that we can do too, right? So we've talked about this four component Rankine cycle, right? And we've talked about thinking about these processes as Lego, right? So we have, and maybe my turbine is one piece of Lego and my condenser is another piece and I can put them together, right? So our four component Rankine cycle is a little bit like us playing with Duplo. So we're sort of understanding how these things work, right? But through the rest of the class, we're going to be moving from working with Duplo to becoming these master builders, right? So we're going to start building some really cool cycles here. We're going to put these components together in more and more interesting ways, and that's going to help us improve our thermal efficiency. So maybe the answer to this question, how can we sort of increase the complexity of our cycle to get better thermal efficiency, maybe it comes from the definition of thermal efficiency itself, right? So we know our desired energy output is net power and our energy cost is heat in. So maybe we can increase the complexity in a way that it's increasing our net power, or at least that our net power increases faster than our heat in. But our next strategy, which we're calling reheat, I like to think of this as increasing our net power, right? Because it's kind of like, you know, in our normal Rankine cycle, right? Our four component Rankine cycle, we have one turbine, right? But if one turbine is good, hey, why don't we add a second turbine, right? Maybe that'll be better, right? So now what's going to happen is we come out of our, so here's our condenser. Right? We go up our pump, we increase the pressure again, and now we get into the boiler. Right? The boiler is here, it heats up the fluid, it gets us to some steam, and now we go through the first turbine. This is sometimes called the stage one turbine or the high pressure turbine. But as we do this, we're decreasing the enthalpy of the fluid. So it's like, well, why don't we just end that first turbine and go back into the boiler? Because this, you know, we've got this... Uh, fluid that's coming out here but it's not like it's still got a lot of energy left in it right so it doesn't take that much enthalpy to get back to a state that looks like here if state three kind of approaches state one you know it, we could just heat this back up right and go back into some other low pressure turbine where maybe here maybe we come in at the same temperature but it's just at a lower pressure Right? And now we go through this low pressure turbine, right, or the second stage turbine, and we get a little bit more power out of the system. Right? So 
if we put in two turbines like this, do we end up improving our net power? We got to be careful here because we're not just improving the power. In between these two states, right, in between these two stages of turbines, we have to reheat the fluid, right? And we do. We already have the boiler here. So it's not like it's um, all that complicated to put some more piping in here to heat the fluid back up. But it means that we have to be burning more fuel to heat this up from state two to state three. So what we're going to look at is, does this improve thermal efficiency, right? And hopefully it's not too much of a spoiler to say that, you know, if we're learning about this in thermodynamics class, it probably works, right? So what a TS diagram looks like in this case is here's our original TS diagram for our four component Rankine cycle. So now we're taking away that single turbine, right? And we put in a high pressure turbine that's going to go from our high pressure, pH, to some intermediate pressure, pi. So now we move from this state to some, in this case, isentropic outlet. But now what we're going to do, right, so that gives us our first stage power. But now what we're going to do is we're going to do this reheat part of the cycle where we add some more heat. So here we're at this intermediate pressure, but I like to increase the temperature at this intermediate pressure so I can run through the turbine again. This is also nice because now instead of coming down here and cutting through the vapor dome where we get some uh, saturated liquid inside our turbine, which maybe damages our turbine blades, now I'm increasing the temperature here. So I move out here in the saturated vapor region and maybe I miss the uh, vapor dome altogether over here, right? So now I'm going to increase my temperature at this intermediate pressure so I get superheated vapor. I run that through my second turbine and I get some power out of this second stage turbine. And then I have to reject a little bit more heat too because this has more enthalpy than it would have if I just went through one turbine here. So I've increased my heat in. And if that was the only thing that happened, this would not be a great thing because heat in is the cost that we pay to run these cycles. But I also increase my net power when I do this. And when I increase my net power, what that means is that maybe the increase in the benefit, which is the net power, is happening faster than the increase in the heat transfer in. Right? And that's pretty believable because here we're just heating up a superheated vapor or maybe a saturated vapor to a superheated vapor, it's much easier, it's much less energy intensive to increase the temperature of steam than it is to increase the temperature of liquid water, right? We know this, right? The watch pot never boils, right? So when we do this, we're increasing our average temperature of heat addition, and that tends to increase our thermal efficiency. So this is the textbook's version of what this TS diagram looks like for a reheat cycle. Right? And again, we kind of run through this high-pressure turbine, heat the fluid back up, run through the low-pressure turbine, and then it looks like a normal Rankine cycle. Condense, increase the pressure, boil. So how do I go about analyzing these cycles? Right? So I still want to understand what the characterization parameter here is. And because it's a heat engine, the characterization parameter is still thermal efficiency. So it's still net power divided by heat in. But now, when we think about our net power, we have turbine one, we have pump one, that's normal, right? But we also have this second turbine, right? So now we can think of net power as the power from turbine one, plus the power from turbine two, plus the power from the pump, recognizing that that power from the pump is going to be negative. What about the heat in? How do I find the heat in? And for me, if I'm going to mess this up, this is where I'm going to mess it up. Because I think for me, it's pretty obvious that I have this heat going in at the boiler. So I usually remember this first heat addition stage. But I have to remember that this is called a reheat cycle or maybe a Rankine cycle with reheat. So that means that I have this second heat addition part. Right? So my Q dot in becomes... Q dot through the boiler the first time plus Q dot through the boiler the second time. 
This is heat addition in both cases, so we're adding heat both times. So when I want the thermal efficiency for a Rankine reheat cycle, I take the turbine power plus the second turbine power plus the pump power, which is negative, divided by the heat transfer rate through the boiler the first time plus the heat transfer rate through the boiler the second time. Another or more general way I can think about thermal efficiency in all Rankine cycles is I take the sum of the turbine powers plus the sum of the pump powers and divide by the sum of all the heat addition steps. So how do I find those things? I'm going to run through my common assumptions. So typically I'll say I'm at steady state. I have one inlet, one outlet, no kinetic energy change, no potential energy change, adiabatic for the turbines, passive for the boiler, no friction losses between my different components, and no heat losses between those components either. So for turbines, I'm going to get m dot times h in minus h out. For condensers and boilers, I'm going to get m dot times h out minus h in. And for pumps, I'm also going to get m dot times h in minus h out. And then I always use these equations because they come from the first law and I trust the first law. And then I think about the sign and I use the sign convention hip to win. If I do that, I think on an exam, it doesn't matter how complicated I make the cycle look. You follow this process. It doesn't matter how many reheat stages I add. You're going to be able to figure the problem out. In order to really solve this problem, you got to do the symbolic solution here. But then you got to ask yourself, what's the fluid? And when you know what the fluid is, and you know what type of process it is, you can find the specific enthalpy, or at least the change in specific enthalpy through ideal turbines and pumps, and through real turbines and pumps, if you're given something like the isentropic efficiency. And that concludes the lecture for today. Hopefully this helps us understand how we can Im increase the complexity of the cycle but the benefit of that is that we get better thermal efficiency. And that saves us money while reducing emissions. See you next time on Thermodynamics.